What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and today I'm actually really excited for the topic that we're going to be covering today, which is MK Ultra trauma based mind control programs, um, specifically the Genesis program project, I should say, today, with a survivor herself from these programs and projects, Ms. Penny L.A. Shepard. Penny is just absolutely amazing. She's a wealth of knowledge. I look to her as a complete authority on this project. Uh, the specific topic. She's been going public with it for a few years now. Um, she didn't have the awareness that she had been through these programs until much later in her life. And when she started connecting those dots, I believe that the public is very lucky that now we get to learn from her because she's been sharing a lot. She has an amazing website with a blog. She has tons of other content out. Um, and she's just really moved herself into being an authority on this topic. And I'm really excited for you guys to get to learn from her today. Um, the show Stranger Things also, I wanted to bring this up because I think that this will help capture your attention also to everybody listening. There's shows that have actually been based off of Penny's life and in characters based off of her. Um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit, specifically the X-Files and Stranger Things. Um, and I'm really excited for you guys to meet Penny. So Penny, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on MK Ultra. It's something that I believe that uh, most people in the world are not apprised that it even exists. I know that I did not know that it existed until I left my husband in March of 2016. I was living in San Diego. And when I left, I went to my aunt's house. Later on, I found out that my aunt was, uh, she was actually a Mengele. The, there was a divergency of the name, of the spelling of the name, which is Mengele, as in Joseph Mengele. And then I went to my brother's, found out that he was a deep state NSA. And I'm not even sure that he's actually my brother. I know he lived in the same house with us. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure. I even, I even told him when I was told that my agent was my brother, my agent who I never lived with, didn't know who he was. And he was my agent in the 90s. His name is John. And I found out from my first husband, Steve Zenos, in June of 2016, that John was my brother. Then I went to go see one of my former drummers. I'm a singer by trade. That's what I did, a singer, uh, an actress trained by Stella Adler and a writer. I've been writing since I was a child. And so I was told by my, uh, by my drummer, I verified for him. I, he grew up with my first husband, Steve. And I said, Steve told me that John's my brother. And uh, that was, I was in Costa Mesa. I think the last, the last time that I was there, it was uh, July 2nd, July 13th, Steve died. My husband who told me that John was my brother. So I, I was told he died of a heart attack. So after he told me that he was my brother, literally 11 days after I left, um, after I left Costa Mesa or left Irvine, that, that region, because I went back there to try and recover my memories because I couldn't remember anything. So I went back, I drove back in my vehicle to all the places that I'd lived before. I was homeless at that time. So I lived in my truck and I drove back to all the addresses that I lived at and I would go to a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts and, um, and write and then I would try to retrieve the memories and try to remember what happened to me there because I literally had no memories. I had memories from childhood that were very sparse from uh, teen years that I couldn't actually remember. I remembered meeting Darrell, who was a person I lived with for five years, almost six years. And he, I met him in Florida at my high school. I met him. I was in high school. I met him at a Denny's. And I found out later on that he is the son of Albert Spears. How Albert Spears was Hitler's minister of war for people that don't know. So how I could prove any of this, I actually can't. You'd have to do a DNA test. Um, I don't even know that, um, I don't know how it transpired that he is the son of Albert Spears. I don't know if he was, it was in vitro fertilization, if it was his mom slept with someone, I, I couldn't tell you because I wasn't there. Darrell was born in 1945. So I was born in 1958. He is 13 years older than me. So right now I'm 63. I was born August 11th, 1958. 
in Hollywood Memorial Hospital in Hollywood, Florida. And many people also don't understand that Hollywood, Florida was basically created for Hollywood, California. It was to, to bring the elite and the seasoned elite to come down to Florida, which at one point Florida was a swampland. So um, there is an individual that I got in contact with. Her name is Megan Walsh. And uh, we started talking because I had written something about her father sacrificing uh, her brother. Now, people and have to understand Walsh's this. father is John Walsh. John Walsh, America's Most Wanted host. Now, and his son was Adam Walsh. Now, people don't understand when you say sacrifice, it can mean many, many things. A sacrifice doesn't always end up in death. Okay, a sacrifice could be a sexual sacrifice. It could be you hand your daughter over to someone and then they're, they're, that person's the handler. It could be that they attend an event uh, in which they're either watching the event. For instance, um, I now know that the person behind pretty much every band that I was in, uh, there was some influence behind those bands which involved my brother. Uh, John and he's a prolific agent and one of the places that I played was called Dads in Poway. Dads had many names. One of them was called the Totem Pole because this girl, people come to me with all different uh, requests. One girl came to me and asked me to solve a murder. So she said that her friend of many years had, uh, had been stabbed and thrown somewhere near this venue, which was then renamed Dads. And I said to her, and I didn't know the names of it. And I said, uh, there's something about the land, like it's some kind of Indian burial ground, which they built this on. And she said, oh my God, it used to be called the totem pole when she was growing up. And she said, that's where my girlfriend, her body was found like across the street stabbed like 30 times or something like that. I said, well, that was a, a sacrifice. So the dad's venue, because it became many, many names. And when I research, I research something to its fruition. So I try to go back to the beginning of the, how something started. So dad's was actually owned by Stan Kamininsky and the Kamininskys were a Hitler brigade. And, and Stan looked a lot like, it wasn't him, but he had a familiar uh, bearing to the Kamininsky, who was the head of the, uh, the Hitler Brigade. Many people came from Germany, um, from all over the world that supported the agenda of the Reich and the New World Order, because essentially that's what we're talking about. And so they came to America. They were given new identities. They truncated the names, like my husband, Steve Zenos. His name was a very long name. I don't know what it was but it was a very long name and they truncated it to Zenos, which means stranger. So I was, when I married Steve, I was literally Mrs. Stranger. And now many people have claims that uh, that, that little girl is them. And uh, it's definitely me. And I wasn't happy about it. I'm not getting money. I'm not selling t-shirts. I'm not, you know, I cried when I found out. And I, te I sent an email to Darrell and said, I know I'm that little girl. I know that's me. And that's in because, straight things, right? Yes. Yes. What was it? And, what was that? How did you know that that was you? Well, first of all, uh, my mom shaved my head for a lot of many years. When I started growing up and she divorced my dad, she shaved my head. I used to cry because I, I'm a girl. I just wanted to be a girl. I didn't want to look like a boy. And I remember an, what, going to the bookmobile and a grandma and a grandpa arguing, oh, that's a girl. No, that's a boy. It was a song that was out at that time. I think Twiggy had uh, gotten, you know, the short hair and then also Rosemary's Baby, they cut the hair really short. So there was a song called, Are You a Girl or Are You a Boy? With your long, long hair, you look like a boy. You may be a girl. Hey, you look like a boy, right? And so I remember them arguing about it and I was so frustrated and I turned around and said, I'm a boy. And the grandma said, no, honey, that's a girl. <laughs> But they were literally arguing. I was like, are, were they trying to like hide me or, but now I know that it was part of a humiliation ritual. And also when your hair is that short, if they're putting electrodes on you, it has less chance of your hair catching on fire. So when you come home and you've been drugged, right, you know, 
And you're like, why am I missing this hair? <laughs> so I didn't have to worry about that. And I was older at that point too. So when I was younger, I did have, you know, it wasn't really long hair, but I did have, I was born a toehead. I was born blonde. I color it now, but um, you know, I was born blonde, blue eyes. And, uh, but I don't actually know who my mother was because um, unfortunately, I'm learning some things about myself from Stranger Things, which is weird because movies are real militarized, strategized intel. And in there, she's given away. So either either I was like gestated in Irene Mengele's um, with her ovum and uh, he married another woman, Martha Mengele, which was the widow of his uh, brother to keep the farming uh company which they had they had an implement a tool implement company uh called mingalay uh farming or something like that so he, they wanted to keep the money in the family so when the brother died i mean when the brother died then the wife martha the widow marries joseph and this is after irene divorced him irene had one son that i know of i don't know if she had other children she had one son and that son's name was rolf and that son looks like my murder brother david so when i started waking up I asked, why does John look like Joseph Mengele? Why do I look like Irene Schoenbein, who married Joseph Mengele? And why does my murdered brother, David, look like Rolf? And no one answered. And that also explained why when I saw John again um, in his office, that I said that he looked familiar to me. And I wasn't sure why. And then later on, when I was finding out stuff and I saw him on the red carpet with an individual that he represents, and I said, oh, he looks like David. That's why. So all my brothers are, were six foot three. David was six foot three. My dad was six foot four. Rob, six foot three. John, six foot three. All share the same, you know, stature. Um, David had, I believe, blonde hair when he was growing up. But Rob had thick, coarse, wiry hair. And his hair was very dark, almost black. So that's why we question, is he indeed, you know, from this family and I don't know where he came from I don't I don't even know where he was born he might have been born in New York because the house that I lived in it didn't um it wasn't even built until 1954 and Rob was born in 1952 my sister Sandy was born in 1954 my brother David was born in 1956 and I was born in 1958 so every two years there was a child born and um I I still don't know how that transpired you know, was I in vitro fertilization? I found out that my mom was indeed a Hitler baby. Now, the Hitler babies were born for Hitler through the Reich. So women would either have sex with the officers or they would get in vitro fertilization. The, and during the war, what they did during World War II was Joseph Mengele worked uh, eugenics, which is actually genetics now. And he reported to a person called Von Schur. Von Schur, uh, I think that's probably where we got for sure. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Right? But um, Von Schur uh, was the head of the eugenics, the worldwide eugenics. Uh, wow. You know, he was the head of it. And I believe that Von Schur also worked with uh, General uh, Harito Ishii. Ishii was in World War II. And I found this out from the X-Files because somebody asked me to watch an episode of the X-Files and the X-Files are real. So when I say movies are real militarized intel, this is what I'm referring to. Um, in the X-Files, it's season three, episode nine and 10. A person came to me and these are how some of my conversations go. When we, when we speak, we share a cosmology. We share our information with one another and then I will send you things that I believe are pertinent to you. And hopefully those, the people that I engage with will do the same. So this individual came to me and she said, her AKA was Betsy Ross. It's not her name. I love her name, by the way, but I'm not going to say it. And so her AKA was Betsy Ross. So I told her everything is important because I, when I was living with my spy husband, Steve Zenos, he was a spy. Um, I named my bird in, it was about 80, 83, this was in the 80s, 83. I named my bird Snowden. Okay. And Snowden was born in 1983, by the way. And um, my husband went to school in Palos Verdes. His parents taught at, 
I think it was Rolling Hills or no, he went to Rolling Hills and the people that were in the Falcon and the Snowman, it was a movie about espionage played by Sean Penn and um, I forget the other person. It was Christopher Boyce. Um, I always forget their names, but they, uh, they were arrested for espionage. So his parents were spies and handlers and they taught at that school. They were counselors at the school. Steve told me he bought cocaine from the snowman. That's why it was called the snowman. So those two individuals were arrested, incarcerated for 40 years for uh, selling state secrets, right? Well, I didn't call my bird snowman, which I should have, right? Right. But I didn't. I called him Snowden. Okay, so that's a weird name to come up with. Yeah, I've never even heard of with that name besides, you know, the person. Right? So yeah. was somebody talking to me, uh, was somebody talking about Snowden when I was under MK Ultra, which is essentially hypnosis? And it's not just hypnosis, it's also, it's a form of hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, implantation, uh, trauma, which binds you to your, uh, to your perpetrator, which then becomes your handler. And they'll do this in early childhood, prelingual, before you have the opportunity to speak. My mother had told me that she was raped by her mother prelingually. So this causes a disassociative. And so that was my grandmother who lived in Hollywood that I grew up with. And um, so my grandmother who lived in Hollywood also, I believe she was a singer. So I'm a second generation singer. And uh, she probably lived very close to where the Walshes were because the Walshes lived 13 miles from my house or 13 minutes from my house. And I didn't know any of this. So when we start talking with one another, we share... Uh, we share our stories. So this individual came to me and she said, I would like to know what happened to me when they took my, um, my, my ovaries. I had cancer. I overcame it. And I said, well, clonate is in Riverside. She told me it was at your Belinda hospital. I said, clonate's in Riverside. I believe they probably took your ovum and they froze them and they're using them to create, uh, you know, anomalies and chimeras and babies and clones. She's like, okay. So then I said, all right. So you know, go and watch a bunch of the X-Files and call me in the morning, like, you know, take an aspirin, call me in the morning. So she calls me a couple of months later and she says, you need to watch this. I'm like, why? She says, well, it's episode three. It's the alien autopsy It's called Nisi. And uh, she says, uh, Scully goes to visit Betsy. And I'm like, okay. And she says, and she's told that Betsy has cancer. I'm like, okay. She says, oh, that's not all. I say what? She says, Penny answers the door. I'm like, what? So I say, okay. So I go back now because I research everything. I go back and I research it and I find out I, I, I do character analysis. So I write uh, stories and then I also do the back stories for all of the characters. So in this instance, I go and I look to see who is playing the character Penny and what is the character Penny's name? And this is how they're, they're officially telling me, yes, Penny, it's you. So um, the character's name is Penny Northern. So Gillian Anderson was born in Chicago, but she was raised in London. She went to uh, University at London um, and then she comes back to Chicago. All right, so I was born in Hollywood, California, which is, I mean, sorry, Hollywood, uh, Florida, which is considered South, the South, All right? So I would be Penny Southern, right? So the character's name is Penny Northern. She's played by Gillian Barber. Gillian Barber is my age. So Gillian is playing Penny. And Penny tells Scully, who's played by Gillian Anderson, that everything that happened to us happened to you, that you have alien DNA and that you are implanted and that they made babies and clones from your DNA. Yeah. Ooh, what a revelation. Holy smokes. Yes. So then, um, and, I, and I asked this question in the 90s because my husband, Sam, looked like David Duchovny. I mean, like, they could be brothers. That's how closely they look. Every time I see David Duchovny, I, I kind of want to punch him because he reminds me so much of my ex, who is now dead. 
But I asked him back then, why does David Duchovny look like you? And why does Gillian Anderson look like me? Now, I was married to him at the time. Or maybe I wasn't. Maybe it was the year before. But he says, oh, I don't think she, Gillian Anderson's that pretty. Really? Because you just slap me in the face. I think you're prettier, but she's beautiful. I do see the resemblance for sure. Thank you. So, but I asked him that. And of course, it's crickets. Nobody says anything. Now, he's actually, there are many composites that are made from those characters. So that's not just one person that they're portraying. But it is a composite of many different people. So, you know, I'm not a medical examiner. Okay, so that character is not me. But I did work covertly for the CIA and the FBI, unbeknownst to me. I didn't know this. But I wasn't on the payroll for the FBI. I never worked in a, I never worked as a police officer. My husband, my last husband was a police officer. The X-Files were also started on a wiggy case of exenotransplantation and they were filed under X in the file cabinet. Exenotransplantation is a transplantation of genetic materials from one species to another. That means we have more than one species on this planet. I was married to Dr. Zenos who was a psychologist. His parents were psychologists, but they were also covert deep state agents. And they knew my brother, John, which I didn't know that they, they knew him until my husband, my first husband told me in June of 2017. And then when I, I know I was being recorded at Bob's, when I got recorded there, that was around like the first or the second, because the last time I was in in Newport Beach, it was the second I looked at my pictures to see, and then he died on the 13th of July. And he was a millionaire, and I was homeless at the time. Wow. Yeah. There's so many so, things with this. That's the so part. So then, when I became really enemy of the state, when I became enemy of the state, which I knew that I was, and I got locked up in a crazy house for a year. And I was asked before that happened, do you want to end up like Snowden and Assange? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, listen, I'm a singer. Why would I end up like Snowden and Assange? And you didn't and know at was, this time that you didn't have the memories yet, right? So that had to have been really confusing. No, no I, was, I was working on it because I'd been made homeless and I started when first when I moved in with my brother, I was there for almost a year. But when I moved in, I started researching. I started researching um, psychop, psych, psychopaths. I call it psychopath, psychopathology. Yeah. I started researching them. I started researching how the DSM came into existence. I started researching post-traumatic stress disorder. I started researching because I had studied psychology when I was in ninth and 10th grade. So I studied all of the the psychologists, but I study them from a different vantage point because we thought that they were good people. Now, in retrospect, we know that Freud was a complete fraud. He was a pedophile and uh, he was a cocaine addict. So, you know, this is the person that's the father of modern day uh, psychoanalysis. I'm going to say I, I'm going to refute anything that these individuals have put forth. And also Donald Jew and Cameron, he was creating he, he was breaking minds under MK Ultra at the Allen Memorial Institute. He was, he was the world psychological uh, president, basically, of world psychology. And he was working with the AMA, the ADA, and the APA. So that would be the American uh, Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, and the American, American Dental Association. And he was, while he's breaking minds, he's telling them, hey, invent these drugs so that we can diagnose these MK ultras that I broke their mind with as being schizophrenics. And then we can put them on these drugs and everybody gets to make money. And then let's also take fluoride, which is a byproduct of aluminum plane production. And let's put it in, uh, in uh, water and let's put it as a dental treatment, which in fact, it actually decayed the, the tooth of the individual and it causes cancer. But and yet- it, Like calcify- the pineal the, gland also? Yes. All right. So, so that obstructs your ability to actually do what we naturally can do, which is uh, the character on Stranger Things, which can telepathically communicate, 
that's no big deal. Okay. Everyone can do it. Really? But yet if yes, but if you say that you can hear people's thoughts, they're like, okay, you must be schizophrenic. Right? Because oh no. If you pray and God answers you and you've got this MK Ultra doctor there, so you know, you say, Well, I talk to God, you know, do you have voices voices in your head? Well, I talk to God. Does he answer you back? Uh yeah, he does. Okay. Thank you. And they were schizophrenic, right? Because God talks back to you. Oh my gosh. And you're hearing a voice in your head. What other gifts do we naturally have that are shut off through all these? We have all, we have all the same gifts that that character has. So while people will look at it and say, you know, oh, that's, that's really cool or whatever. They are exacerbated that the, the government weaponized humanity to exacerbate the gifts. So they would torture the individual and then the individual would then, the, that natural gift would be exacerbated. So therefore you can use the frequency because we're all frequency. You can use that frequency to generate a storm. Um, I remember it snowed in Miami and I think they had me do this at Darrell's house. It was the first time it ever snowed. I'd lived there for all my life. I moved in with Darrell in Fort Lauderdale, which is only 20 minutes away from my mom. And uh, I woke up this one day and I said, Darrell, the, it snowed in Miami. Why didn't you wake me up to tell me? He says, oh, it snows all the time in Minnesota, Penny. It's no big deal. I said, well, Minnesota is not Miami. You know, it never snows in Miami. And I think they had me make it snow in Miami. Really? While so I was sleeping. So people, we have that ability to control weather with our mind mm -hmm. or with a, another sense that, that we're not aware of. If you get angry, and I, I encourage people, just try it. If you get really, really angry, is there a storm? Does a storm come up? If you're crying hysterically, is it start raining? I mean, just saying, just ask. Just ask yourself. Just take note of what's around you. When I was at, I was at this Starbucks, and I was telling them, and I was praying for a tornado for Branson because Branson's pretty evil. And, um, and I was there like most of the day and talking to the baristas because that's what I would do. I would go into a Starbucks. I would use the Wi-Fi. I would stay like from 10 in the morning until 10 at night and I'd do my work. All of a sudden, um, I'm reading from a script to my then handler, George. I'm reading from a script from Supernatural and Supernatural is very wiggy. A television series with Jensen Ackles, who, by the way, was on set of Rust. The debacle with Al Alec Baldwin shooting um, uh, the, the director and murdering the director. Well, Jensen Ackles plays the lead. He plays Dean in Supernatural. So he was on the set. He was playing a sheriff. He was on that set. So I was reading from a script from Supernatural in the Starbucks to my friend, not my friend, I thought he was. And, um, and I'd gotten angry that day and I texted John and I said, I'm pissed with like 5,000 S's on one T. And he says, why? And he knows that's gonna make me even matter, right? Why? And so I say, because all my family, all my family are psychopaths and criminals and you're one of them. And I said, crawl back, from, crawl back in the hole that you crawled out of. And I'm really angry. And then all of a sudden, the lights go off in the Starbucks and the police come and an ambulance comes and a fire truck comes. And apparently all of the boulevard was shut down. The electricity just went off. And so I told my friend, um, I'm going to come to you. He was in Gray's Lake. And so they say to me, I go, uh, I'm out of here. And so I like full, I, they come up to me, they say, Penny, did you start this storm? And I say, I don't know. And then can I do that? And they're like, cause you've been praying for a storm all day long. Did you start this storm? And I say, I don't actually know, but I think I need to go. So then I close my computer, I pack everything up. I get in the car, but I'm really angry. I drive very slowly past the police. And it's lightning all over Chicago. And I'm really, really angry. And then I get on the freeway and I'm hysterical and I'm crying. 
and I say, I want all the planes to fall from the sky. And I don't want them to hurt any good people. I just want them to hurt evil people. And then George calls me on the phone. He says, Penny, did you start the storm? I say, I don't know. And then I say, if I did, I can't stop it. And then I put my hand in front of the, the, in front of the windshield. And I say, I want all the cars off the freeway. And all the cars go off the freeway. And I'm alone on the freeway. George has to slow down. I say, I'm going the speed limit, George. And um, there's no need for me to slow down. I don't, I don't speed. I said, besides which, there's no cars on the freeway. And then he says, well, you need to stop the storm. I said, I can't. I don't know how to stop it. He said, I knew it was you because when I saw the lightning flash, I fell to my knees. It blinded me. That's why I called you. I said, well, can I do that? He says, yes, you can. I said, well, I can't stop it. And I was just hysterical. The harder I cried, the more it rained. And when I finally got to his place, I said, you're just going to have to talk to me because I can't stop this storm. I didn't even know I could do that. I didn't know I could start it. And then when I got to him, I gave him my car keys and it's, the storm stopped. Yeah. So apparently we can do these things. What other it's not just me. For, for people who haven't seen Stranger Things or maybe aren't super familiar with the gifts that um, the character Eleven has, um, what other things is she able to do that you can do? Well, I'm pretty sure they used me to kill people with my mind. I don't remember doing it, and it wouldn't be my first choice of anything to do. I, you know, I don't have any cognitive memory of doing it, but she did indeed do that. And I remember, I remember the hospital gown and, uh, I don't remember the lockup, but I remember the hospital gown. And they also tried to get her to kill a cat. And she's like, no, I'm not going to kill a cat. Now, I don't particularly like cats, but I don't have anything against them. I love all animals, but they're not my favorite animal. But I would never kill one, ever, under any circumstance. I love animals. I, uh, so whatever they engendered me to do, that's not on me. And, and I'm... I'm having, you know, it's, I'm having um, to regain those memories that they erased from me. So these are not things that I would suggest that anybody try to do, but the anger is what engenders you because it's the isolation. So when they isolate you, they electroshock you, they drug you, they rape you, they engender a fury inside of you. You can also light fires. You can start fires, fire starter. And this comes from all of the satanic ritual abuse. So they're engendering literally an uncontrollable anger, but it's not an anger that's directed to good people. It's an anger that's directed to the evil people who are perpetrating it. But the DARPA um, weaponizes it. So also under MK Ultra, MK Ultra, it's broad, it has a broad based meaning. So its first meaning, which was told to me by a super soldier who kind of was very whacked, um, is um, manufactured killers utilizing lethal tradecraft requiring assassinations. So they school you in the art. Gosh, my nose is running. They school you in the art of, uh, sorry, because I almost started crying. It's, <laughs> they school you in the art of uh espionage in many capacities so they school you in the art of sex espionage because they uh they make you sexually active at like when you're two because they're raping you when you're an infant so they they engender that then they um and they do a lot of different things to you and you become erased i presume that's why i was a selected individual for covert activities because it was I was unaware that I was even doing them. So my mom used to, I remember my mom hypnotizing my aunt Edna and uh, talking about she wanted to go to Scotland. And then my aunt Edna paid for her to go to Scotland. <laughs> and I remember when she was hypnotizing her, I was like, oh, I can't be hypnotized. Really? Because you've been hypnotized since you were like a child. They could probably just like walk over to me and go, and I'm under. 
Can you talk about that just a little bit? Um, I got training in uh, autism and neuro-linguistic programming, but I'm really shocked at how many people have no idea what those things are. They just, they look at a movie that has showed hypnoti hypnotism and it's some weirdo with a little clock and then he's making them do really strange things. And people get this idea of it from the movies that it's actually not. I'd love if you could just explain what it actually is and what neuro-linguistic programming is and why it's important for those programs. Um, neuro-linguistic program is one of the most potent forms of hypnosis that exists on the earth. My evil stepfather took a puppy that I had um, that I'd given to him and he named her Kitsa. He returned her to me two weeks later. Every time the doorbell rang for the rest of her life, she rolled over and peed. Okay, that is a post-hypnotic suggestion. He broke the puppy. It was a puppy. He broke the puppy. Okay, so that's what they do with human beings. They will take something which actually could have good applications, healing applications, but they will take it and they'll use it for their nefarious reason. So, and by the way, even though it's cliche, the watch thingy, okay, I gave, um, God, my nose is still running. I gave Darrell a pocket watch. And when I went back 40 years later, he said, hey, here's this pocket watch you gave me. It was broken. I said, I don't even remember giving it to you, right? He said, well, I asked you to give it to me, but he had it. It was 40 years. The man has, you know, six exotic cars. And I say to him, oh, I'll get a fix for you, babe, right? Hello. You know, I'm like indigent, right? I'll get a fix for you. And, um, but it begs the question, why did he keep it for 40 years broken? He could have gotten it fixed at any time. Why did he keep that for 40 years? And how did it get broken? Because I don't remember it getting broken. So then I followed suit. I gave Steve a pocket watch. And I traded in Darrell's engagement ring for the pocket watch at a thrift store, at a, a pawn shop. I gave John a pocket watch. John's pocket watch, I put a song in it that I wrote called We Only Have Time. And uh, on John's pocket watch, there was a train on the pocket watch, meaning he's the conductor of time. And inside the pocket watch, I said, we only have time, which is the name of my song that I wrote when I was with Steve. Thank you for yours. And I didn't sign it my name. I signed it the band's name, which was Stinger. I asked him when I was in Branson, do you saw that pocket watch? And then I sang the song that I'd written because I said, that's a song that I wrote that I gave to you in the pocket watch. And I said, do you still have that pocket watch? Because he told me that his wife took the pocket watch. And so when I talked to him, when I was in Branton, I said, someone's stealing your toys. Well, I was referred to as the toy. And then later on, I found out that Steve also had a company with my uh, guitar player, uh, Mark Stasiavich who I refer to as my Russian guitar player, which I'm not exactly sure why, but something, right? He had to be a spy. And, um, and the, the, whole, the whole thing with the pocket watches are that that's indeed what they use them for in the old days. They would use it to, to hypnotize you or, and so I gave these three people the pocket watches. Why? Because they were master manipulators. And I can't ever remember uh, Steve using the pocket watch on me or John using a pocket watch on me. But by that point, no one needed to use a pocket watch on me. When you're a baby, right, you're like you're doing this thing with the with the um, the the mobiles that they put around. Right. So a baby is easily entertained with the pocket watch. So the baby will watch the pocket watch. So you can hypnotize the baby by doing this. So a uh, post-hypnotic suggestion will actually last forever until you are aware of that post-hypnotic suggestion. So if they give you a post-hypnotic suggestion when you're a baby and you're unaware of that post-hypnotic suggestion, it will last into adulthood it will last until you die until you actually recognize that post-hypnotic suggestion i was hypnotized by the amazing kreskin the amazing kreskin nobody knows who he is but he was an amazing hypnotist right he's so amazing that i can't tell you what he did to me when i was under even today i don't know what did the amazing kreskin 
what post-hypnotic suggestions did he supplant in me? What post-hypnotic suggestions did my mother put in me? So the, the hypnosis, uh, here, here's, how, here's how I can explain how important uh, hypnotism is. I don't know if it was the, the Teller show, but in Vegas, the hypnotist tells the woman, um, tells one man, you know, when you awake, you're going to, you know, cook like a chicken and take your clothes off. And then he tells this other woman, when you awake, you will not see anyone on the stage with you. And in about 30 minutes, then you'll be able to see the people on the stage. But when you awake, there will be, you will not be able to see anyone on the stage. This is how it affected her sight. When she awoke, there were a bunch of people on the stage with her, but she saw no one. One of the people lit a cigarette. She freaked out and started running off the stage because all she saw was a cigarette in midair. So he affected her ability to see. That's how potent this is. So then under MK Ultra, what they would do with a covert operative is you're sleeping in a hotel or at home, whatever. They call your phone, call your hotel room, and they say, the, the moon is blue. You know, hey, Benny, this is John. The moon is blue. And then you're like, right, you freeze. And then they give you your instructions. Then you do whatever the instructions are. You're going to go down to this. Uh, you're going to go down to the, you're going to feel restless. You're going to go down to the panel bar. You're going to meet someone at the panel bar. You're going to take that person up to their room. You're going to sleep with that person. And then we put this thing in your person. You're going to put it in their water. And then when you wake up in the morning, you're going to feel refreshed. And you're going to think you had too much to drink. And then you're just going to go back to your room. And you never see that person again. Maybe two weeks later, that person dies. Wow. That's how they would achieve the, that's how they would achieve the murder. Hold on just a second. Yep. Oh my God. My sister just sent me something. Oh, uh, I won't. Seriously, I won't, but I will talk to you later about that. Just this is my sister. By the way, just come here. Just say hello. Yeah. Just come hi. here. Come here. Yeah, say hi. <laughs> okay, come here. Say hi. This is my sister Susie. Hi. Susie. She's in my headset. Yeah. Come, 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 come. Yeah. See, don't we look alike? Yes, beautiful right. girls. Look at those smiles. Right. So that's my sister. I call her my sister. She's not my actual DNA sister, but she's my sister, you know, for like the best sister I ever had in my entire life. The sister from another mother. My actual sister is pretty much, I would refer to it POS. I think everyone knows what that means. Do you not? Yeah, we know, you know what that means. means? Yep. Okay. That's right. <laughs> so I don't have to elaborate on the acronym there. Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just really interesting because I was just talking about him. No. Yes. You're yes. Just... No. Yes. No. Well, I might have. I don't know. I. I... Right. Because I was talking about him. <sighs> <laughs> but I think it's um, interesting what you're saying because hypnotism is one of the most powerful forms of medicine there is too. And they don't offer it mainstream. Most, I think all insurance, like you can't ever get it covered through anything. You have to pay out of pocket. It's not a cheap service, but the power of, why would you think that of, hypnotism would be now just think about it for a second. Why would it be the most powerful form of healing? Because it's talking to your unconscious mind. And, your unconscious and if you mind, can talk to your, your unconscious body. mind yourself, if you can talk to your unconscious mind yourself, then you can deprogram what they programmed into you. So that's what I try to help people with. I try to help people deprogram themselves with their own research. I don't do anything. I do not go to any doctors because Obviously, the doctors that I saw were MK Ultra handlers. They were malevolent. They tried to kill me. They gave me chemicals. They uh, they tried to uh, basically, you know, erase my memory even more than it was erased. Um, and so I, the, the only drug that I actually take is caffeine. I drink coffee. I love coffee. So, but other than that, um, everything is natural homeopath. I try not to take any aspirin. I use, uh, I think it's willow bark. Um, I use, I just use natural homeopathic, 
remedies to to solve as opposed to taking something that's been synthesized and then they synthesized the actual what god gave us provided us in plant form and you know we we are congruent in in the plants and herbology um your views on cannabis that was outlawed for so long and i've heard uh kathy o'brien speaks that it can help assist deprogramming what right. are your views on cannabis i believe that uh, it's a very healing drug if it's used properly but i also know that they've utilized it with me because when i was with my first husband steve that we were smoking it every day for 10 years they used it against me they used it to further compliance not as not to break MK Ultra, but to actually engender a state of compliance and engender a, a state of MK Ultra. Now, its medical applications in regards to post traumatic stress are unbelievable. Okay, as far as pain, unbelievable. It's a natural herb. I myself do not subscribe to any anything that will alter me whatsoever because the CIA basically obliterated me. And I find that I don't, I don't desire to have my, myself altered in any capacity whatsoever. I like being situationally aware 24 seven, but in regards to its actual uh, medical applications, it's a, it's a brilliant herb and, but it must be facilitated properly. Now, when Kathy O'Brien said that it broke MK ultra, that's not true. It does not break MK ultra. It indeed, uh, it has different applications. So when she's saying that, I say, no, that's not true. And why would you say that? Um, Kathy actually exposed a great deal to the public. Her husband, though, was CIA. He also worked at Emory University, which Emory University is the face of Hawkins Laboratory in Stranger Things. He worked at Emory University doing MK Ultra experiments. That's who, that's who Kathy O'Brien was married to. Then he also, I believe, I think maybe he might have ghostwritten for her. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it appeared that he controlled the narrative. And then they went on tour with Ted Gunderson, which Ted Gunderson was a covert operative. Uh, people are unaware that the auspices of the CIA started with J. Edgar Hoover, who was uh, you know, running around in a tutu, and he was in Hollywood raping little boys while he's uh, you know, trying to frame Marilyn Monroe and JFK and recording everybody else, getting dirt on everybody because that's what the CIA and the FBI do. They get the dirt on you. Now, this is not to say that everyone that works for the FBI is an evil person. I'm, I know there are people that work for the FBI that are good people and they join because they truly wanted to be helpful to uh, humanity as well as the CIA. I believe Kevin Shipp is a good guy. Kevin Shipp works for the CIA. He worked for counterterrorism and he's written a lot of books. And I wrote a chapter about him when Mike Smith came to me and talked to me. I didn't know who he was. He did the documentary Out of Shadows and I was still very skittish. And so when he came to me and said that he was a stuntman for David Duchovny, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, David Duchovny. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what a connection. And so, right. So I wasn't like, you know, my husband was the actual, I mean, I like the lawsuit, you know, what do we do, right? But, you know, now in retrospect, and I'm not saying I'm totally calmed down, but I'm a little bit more understanding than I was when I was first researching things. And we do have to vet everyone because people will come to us and they are not who they say they are. And then they will ambush you. And they, I've had people come to me for interviews and it ends up that I'm being ambushed uh, by the hosts of the show. So I try to counsel other people. If I find somebody that is not a good individual that is asking to interview another person that I know, I will put forth the knowledge that I have. I also don't tell people what to do. I don't say, hey, don't contact this person. You know, that's another form of mind control. Why would I do that? I just say, hey, this is my opinion. So you can take it for what it's worth. But, um, you know, do your own research on it. And it's surprising how many people don't research or don't know how to research, which I find that incredible that they have no concept of how to research. Um, and it's a, just a basic skill. And then people are, are terrified of Google. <gasps> I don't want to use Google. I use DuckDuckGo. I say, dude. 
Seriously, I use everything within my capacity. All right. I use DuckDuckGo. I use Google. I use, you know, um, I use whatever browser I can because it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, they are on your phones. They are in your computers. You know, Siri's getting information from you every time you ask a question. <laughs> you know, she's artificial intelligence and she's building her intelligentsia network from your questions. And they're, they're compiling, like every time you go and do a Google search for anything, or you go, and it's not just Google, it's Yahoo, it's any of the browsers, they're utilizing your, your uh, choices of purchases or, uh, you know, your predilections for music. They're, they're literally, that's how they're building a profile for you. One of the things that I also wanted to say is that, oh, <laughs> <laughs> He makes appearance <laughs> here and there. <laughs> Who is that? That's my little puppy, Kiefer. <laughs> Kiefer! He's like, ah, I'm here. I'm gone. Yeah, he's um, like, I'm asleep. <laughs> uh, uh, so one of the things that I wanted to say is when you're researching, just use all your resources. You know, don't be afraid. And then I also tell people when they call me, they're like, hey, am I going to be more targeted than I am? If I talk to you, I'm like, dude, you were targeted before you even talked to me. Okay. You know, how are you going to get more targeted? Because, you know, you have a choice in this life. You have a choice to make your, your life and your statements count for something so you can speak or not speak. Either way, they're still going to mess with you. Okay. So you, that's, that's your choice. And then you die. So do your best to make a, a difference and be accountable to yourself, to your truth, to truth, be accountable to truth, and then try to try to reach out to those people and there's going to be some bad people that come your way. I have people that call me and I get my phone number out to everybody. And, uh, that way, if they turn out to be, you know, psychos, then I can block them on my phone. Now, if they're extraordinary psychos, which I've had a few of those, um, they will call you from a varying number. Oh, right. So either way, you know, I had one person who, uh, stalked, the um stop the aurora uh theater shooting victims the sandy hook victims the mayor of oregon uh two fbi agents he was like really prolific and he got arrested and thrown in jail under i think a two hundred thousand dollar bond and then uh like a year later he texted me for christmas like what 2019 for christmas and he texted me, my brother, and Kamala Harris. He, he, he sent it in, a, I'm sorry, not texted, he emailed me, my brother, Kamala Harris, and asked some pointed questions about a particular individual who's in the family. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, you know, I just responded and said, uh, cease and desist. And then I blocked him. By the way, if you don't know, you can block someone in your email. You can. It's easy. Good to know. Yeah, you can put them in spam or you can, you know, pull down the little thingy and you can block them so that they can't communicate with you again. But again, you know, a psycho will do another email address and then we start the thing all over again. This particular individual has stalked people for 30 years. <sighs> So it's that's what I call, a, that's a stalker. Yes. A complete so, stalker. Yeah. People ask me, um, when is this program over? When you die. Pretty much. You're going to be stalked for the remainder of your days. You have a choice to speak or not speak. I choose to speak. And, you know, my brother David was murdered after he wrote a book entitled The Whistleblower, which is unpublished, the last copy of it was taken from me in Illinois by an agent who knew Darrell. And he took my briefcase, my leather briefcase, my black leather briefcase, which I just bought. And I didn't even have enough money for that, right? It was $100. And he took the briefcase. He also took my $2,000 computer and lied and said someone stole it from his house. And within the briefcase was the last copy of my brother's screenplay. Oh. And it was uh, called a whistleblower. 
It's unpublished. He put it on um, the copyright office, as I told him to do. But in order to get a copy of that, I would have to sue the copyright office. And I'm devoid of any means because they made me indigent at one point, And now I'm on uh, disability, which I use that to pay for rent, for food. And then I use all my other resources uh, to do what I'm doing, to write and, uh, you know, do, do what it is I do. Now, can you explain the origins of MKUltra? When did the program begin and why? Well, uh, I would say it began millennia ago, yeah. probably in Egyptian times, uh, or like when man first touched earth for the first time, and then man decided, I'm going to make you my slave, went like that. Okay, so it, it's like convincing, cajoling, manipulating, trying to get someone to do your bidding, right? Hey, look at me, I'm a god. <laughs> so they would follow the god, right? Oh, you're a god. Okay, 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 right? If you watch Stargate, you will see the genesis of this individual who came from another planet and then possessed a body. And the Stargates are real, by the way. My sister and I watched the Stargate, it was like 10. 10 seasons so that's 10 years of their lives it was devoted to this and in one of the seasons i actually looked up some of the operation names they're real operations yeah. yeah so when people say movies aren't real or they don't they just don't understand it so if you were to go to your psychiatrist and say hey movies are real and your psychiatrist would say, oh are they okay delusional uh, and what are you writing nothing Right. And then the next thing, you know, you go to the next psychiatrist and it follows you with your medical record because one person took something that you said and made it so that you would be uh, observed as crazy. And then that will enable them down the road to incarcerate you to say that you're crazy. Here's an example. This one woman, which I believe she was MK Ultra, she was, I got a phone call from an individual who told me about his aunt Judy. His aunt Judy, he said, uh, the Secret Service came to her when she was in California and um, they, because she was complaining about Nixon and she, they thought she was going to try to kill Nixon. Now, why would Nixon think that she was going to try to kill him? Did he rape her? Was he raping her children because he's a known pedo? And so she had two little boys. So she left her husband and she went to Illinois. Now she's filing for custody for the boys. It ends up Here's how the story ends. Her husband went back there as well. It ends up her, she kills her attorney or so they say, and then she murders her two little boys. Now, I don't believe that happened. I don't believe she killed her attorney and I don't believe she murdered her little boys because she was trying to get her little boys out of the hands of her husband because the little boys were talking about what happened to them. And in those days, if you're the president, you cannot let any of that stuff get out, right? So just kill the little boys and then she gets thrown in jail. She doesn't just get thrown in jail. She gets thrown in Elgin, which is a place for criminally insane in Illinois. And my brother Rob kept pointing that out saying, see that place there, that's for the criminally insane. And I was like, okay, why are you pointing that out to me? Because I don't do it. I don't even speed. I'm doing anything that's illegal. Why would you point out the place for the criminally insane? So this woman, it ends up, they won't let her testify at her own trial. They say she's thoroughly insane, that she's culpable. And so now anything that she says about Nixon, no one's going to listen because she's crazy and she killed her kids, right? And she killed her attorney. If she actually did that, maybe she didn't. Okay. Then um, she gets an attorney that represents her. And the gentleman that called me, I said, you need to look at this attorney. So I look up the attorney. He's like at an adjunct professor, one of the someplace in Illinois. And um, he represented John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy murdered a bunch of boys and buried them in his house. It dressed up as a clown. He represented John Wayne Gacy. He was John Wayne Gacy's advocate. Wow. And this is the attorney that they give to her. So he says that she's getting ready. My nose is so running. He says she's getting ready to, uh, to testify. She's doing really good. Next thing, she kills herself. Oh, my gosh. She jumps off the roof of, of the Elgin 
place for the criminally insane. And then when I became an enemy of the state, I got electronically triggered on my phone. And people don't understand this is a real thing. There's a gentleman, and I use that term loosely, his name is Michael, um, is Michael Cosbolt. Is it Michael Cosbolt? James Cosbolt, I'm sorry, James Cosbolt. James Cosbolt is a super soldier, and he was married to a, a Haley Myers, who Haley Myers' father was the head of the Myers grocery stores, which I'd never heard of them until I went out to, um, to Illinois. And um, so he ends up like uh, beating her or, and then putting nude pictures of her on Facebook. Uh, so they arrest him, they send him back to uh, the UK jail. He essentially is a super soldier and he, he's beholden to the Vatican. And uh, if you study the super soldier program, it's MK Ultra. So this is the this is the radicalized portion of it. So many different super soldiers. I would be considered a psychic super soldier. I'm not somebody that would come out with a gun or a rifle. Uh, you know, just not me. I'm a singer. I was uh, I was I sang love songs. Okay, I sang for 50 years. That's what I did. Um, James Cosbolt, though, militarily trained, and is able to. We're also able to kill people in a variety of ways. So when I got electronically triggered on my phone, the reason I'm mentioning James Coswell is because if I'd read a little bit of his book, maybe I could have avoided that. He mentions the electronic triggering in his book, which is called Agent Buried Alive. It's a free PDF that anyone can access. He explains how he was trained and how many of the other super soldiers are trained. And as children, as babies, um, in the underground, deep underground military bases. So I'm- um, Is a super soldier for people who have never heard that term? Well, I would be considered a super soldier, a psychic super soldier. So I would be one that would be able to utilize my mind to create a storm, um, telekinesis, which would be, you know, lifting of items. I remember my aunt telling me that she thought that she had a poltergeist at work it was lifting things and throwing it off the shelf it could have been me i don't know you know it's an angry child it's the emissions the frequencies of an angry child the neglect or pain or i was like i was more than just a latchkey kid i came home and i was isolated i wasn't allowed to have friends i wasn't allowed to uh, go anywhere i didn't have a car i wasn't driving you're a child you're trapped so you know i basically was tortured in many, many ways by my, by my mother. Um, chemically, I was caged, I uh, was taken, I know now, to satanic ceremonies. At one point, I thought my mom and I buried somebody in the backyard. And now I think I, I did, but maybe it wasn't our backyard, maybe it was someone else's. Um, he also talks about, you know, being buried in coffins and, uh, and having snakes thrown in on him. And, they, they just, they utilize many different methodologies for compliance, because if your life depends upon your handler, the next handler that gets you, you're going to believe that your life depends upon him. So one of the things that they will do is they will starve you. They will isolate you. They will debase you. They will beat you. They will drug you. You will be raped. Um, and in my case, I, I was erased very easily. In, in a post-hypnotic, you're awake, you're refreshed. You don't remember that you were just in a satanic ceremony. You know, they carry you back to your bed. You wake up in the morning. You know, you go home. Mom says, hey, you want this lollipop? Oh, yeah, sure, ma. And then she gives it to you. And then you're like, I am tired. And you're out, right? And then they can lift your little body up, put you in a cage or whatever, take you to, take you to the neighbors. They do some satanic ceremony and bath it of, of blood. You get raped. And then they bring you back home, they wash it all off, they put you back in your bed. And you're just like, you wake up in the morning, you will awaken refreshed and remember nothing. Right? You awaken, you're refreshed, and you don't remember anything. But these repressed memories, even under hypnosis, those memories are still there. So the good people would actually go back to try and retrieve those memories. But I don't trust anybody. I, don't, I know there are good people out there, but I won't let anyone hypnotize me. And now I say, your best chance is trust yourself. So you can do this on your own. And there are forms which I utilize, which would be the, the televised 
uh, the movies, right? Because we know the movies are real. So I tell people, when you're watching these movies and don't watch television, don't watch anything with commercials because they're subliminal programming and there's enough covert and overt programming within the movies, within the television series. So don't watch anything with commercials. Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately I had to pay, you know, for Netflix to get my memories back and, you know, hey, that sucks. That's wrong. I'm like so many levels. Okay. So that's <laughs> what so I told myself. I said that this is wrong that I have to actually pay to get my memories back. This is just effed up behind beyond anything I can even think of. So watch them with the captions on, even if you're not reading them. It's another way. We we talked about neurolinguistic programming. So the best way I can explain it is it's um you say, You don't want any milk, do you? And you're like, what? Or you want some milk, don't you? And you're like, what? So you effectively use a visual to counteract the oral, what you're hearing. Your auditory is looking at a visual that's contradictory to what you've seen. And it scrambles your head and prepares you for the next MK Ultra insertion. So they would insert into you a series of codes. Now, one of the skills I found when I was deprogramming myself, and John laughed, I don't know why, but when I was in Branson, I was told to go to a Panera Bread by, I don't know if he's an agent of John's, but he's a damn good guitar player, that's for sure. And, um, and he makes guitars. His name's Larry, I'm not gonna grace Larry with his last name. But um, he told me at, at the Butterfly House, which that's funny, right? <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, looking at me like, I know exactly what that is, right? Monarch Butterfly is a programming for those that don't know. So he tells me at the Butterfly House, we have this long talk and I tell him all about John. And then he tells me I should go to the Panera because it's got better Wi-Fi. So I go to the Panera. I'm the, like the only one there and um, using the Wi-Fi, and I know that the NSA is around me. I know it, I feel it. So I go outside and I have a stress ball, because it really helped. And when I talked to John, I said, I have a stress ball now, John. Every time I talk to you, I get so stressed out, I have to play with a stress ball. <laughs> and so um, I went outside, I played with a stress ball, I came back in, and these, these are kind of the ways that I can explain what a psychic super soldier is, okay? because we're trained in covert activity. So I go back in and I look around and there was a person that was sitting to my left to see were up, he was reading a newspaper and I flash instantly back onto a time that John had me go to the, um, <laughs> to the ho Motel 6 to sleep with him, right? I was like, seriously, you can't even get me a good hotel, right? So when I, when I, when I walk up the stairs, I look and I see there's a guy sitting at the pool and he's reading a newspaper, only the newspaper's upside down. Right. So I walk in the room and I say, hey, is your wife having you followed? And he says, why? I say, because somebody's down at the pool and they're reading a newspaper. And he says, and that and what was that about? And I say, well, uh, it wouldn't have alerted me except for the fact that he picked it up and he's reading it upside down, John. And he's like, oh, that was one of his agents that was there. Like he knew that I knew. <laughs> right. He knew that I knew that he was being followed but it had nothing to do with his wife. Okay. So when I'm in the Panera Bread, I'm flashing on 30 years ago, right? That's the first thing in my head. And then I also flash on a movie because I'm trained in virtual reality. So they literally will put you in front of a movie and it will suggest, hey, watch this movie because it's going to give you some covert training. So I flash on this, on this uh, it's, it's not until, I, okay, I'll explain it. The guy's sitting in the chair, he leaves. I walk over, I sit in the chair and I look over and there's the newspaper. So I pick the newspaper up and then I walk back and I sit down and I open up the newspaper and I'm looking through it and I see a puzzle on this side and a cipher on this side, it says cryptology. And I'm like, I don't even like doing puzzles but I look at it and like, nope, I close it. And then I open it back up. <sighs> I'm not gonna do the puzzle but I look at the cipher thing and I'm like, hmm. So in my head, I see the movie with Bruce Willis, Mercury Rising. It's about a nine-year-old who's autistic and he can break codes. They give him uh, the DOD or the DIA 
uh, has this unbreakable code that's supposed to save the spies. Okay. And this little, they put this thing in a children's puzzle. It was actually adult and they give it to the child, but it's a puzzle that the kid, when every time he goes home, he does these puzzles, but he looks at it and his mind goes, and he looks and he sees a phone number and he calls the phone number and says, you know, that says, whatever his name is, you know, that says, um, you are a stranger. And they're like, shit. And so they call the head, who's played by Alec Baldwin, by the way. They call the head guy and they say to him, um, somebody broke the code. Okay, so all this is in my head when I look at the cipher thing, right? Now I start, I don't do puzzles. Seriously, it's not a thing I do. I don't like it. I have always considered it a waste of time. But I look at this and it's an actual cipher that was put in that paper for me. Now, most people would say, oh, wow, that's just crazy, right? Really? Because that cipher was put in there specifically for this child because movies are real. So I broke it down and it basically said, there are two Johns. One is in Branson and one is in, I believe, Washington or New York. It was a long cipher. I broke it down. It, was, it said, you are a sleeper. You can stay and sleep for John or go. It was an intricate cipher. And then at the end of it, there was a joke. And it said, I went to the doctor um, the other day because I, I sprained my ankle. And the doctor said, I feel your sprain instead of I feel your pain because they don't feel anything. And also, John is the son of Joseph Mengele, who is the angel of death. Hitler's scientist, and he's his protege. He's the head of MK Ultra, and he actually doesn't feel anything. But that was what the message was. I could stay in Branton and be a sleeper for him. And at that time, I was heavily under MK Ultra, and thought I was in love with John because he was my agent, my beloved agent. And then when I found out he was my brother, I was like, <laughs> this is like. This is like uh, a friend that a friend of mine uh, did a show called uh, Hollywood Hillbillies, right? So that would be like a good episode for Hollywood Hillbillies. You know, you're like, oh, I found out that John's my brother and I went in love with my brother and I slept with my brother at the Holiday Inn. You know, I mean, these are horrific things, but, and I do, I do joke about it because they're so horrific. And I, I'm not making light of it, but I am because this is my life. And so I choose to, to recognize and unabashedly share my life with everyone because there is no shame in this for me. There's none. I did nothing that I should be ashamed of. You know, I didn't know that John was my brother. He still denies he's my brother um, because he's a pathological liar. And they're trained in the art of deception cia's manual is the art of deception so you know when i'm finding out these things i don't i don't have any shame for what i did or what i didn't do because my motives have always been pure but i was trained to be a covert asset and covert that's when i realized i was like shit i'm a cypherist i'm able to actually decipher numbers and words and put them in perspective and anagrams and i found out that i had this talent which i didn't know so like kathy o'brien it was either kathy o'brien or uh bryce taylor who had explained a portion of how that would work so i'm flying to go uh to go on a country tour in an obscure band in uh, the South Dakotas, I think. And as I'm in it, I fly from San Diego to, and the, the flight is not made, I didn't make the flight, it was made for me. Okay. When I get to LAX, there's a guy there, which I look at him and I'm like, he's a musician. I can tell he's a musician. And because we know, I've been doing it for 50 years. And we get, we get on the plane, this is in the 90s, we get on the plane and we get in an argument because he's got his, face his axe and he wants to put it in there's a captain's luggage thing nobody wants to put it in the plane and i had this like old badass 
Mac Classic. It's like carrying a television around with you, right? There's no way I'm, I'm throwing that underneath the plane. It's going to be all broken little sticks and stones. So um, we argue about that. And then the, the theory says, oh, well, there's room for everyone's stuff. So she puts both of her stuff there. And he walks on the aisle and sits down next to me. <laughs> now, you know that those seat assignments had to be made. Okay, because you don't just arbitrarily in the 90s, you didn't, didn't arbitrarily say, I'm going to sit here. You've got a seat assignment. So he's sitting next to me and I'm still mad. And I'm looking at the window thinking, great, this is going to be a long freaking flight. And then he says to me, I think that Vegas is a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. So I start talking to him because that's something I say. Did he just say to me, what he knew I said, because somebody told him that, was it a string of code words that then I would reiterate something in our conversation, which he would later on remember and write down and decipher, find out where he's supposed to meet a, you know, a connection, a spy connection or a drug connection or a sex trafficking connection or something or a money connection, money laundering connection. That's how it's done. The, the information is disseminated in that manner. And then Somewhere in our conversation, he says that he's one of Prince's bass players because he's flying back to Minneapolis. So then when I go back to see Durrell in 2017, he says, yes, I was raised in the castle in Minneapolis or Minnesota. And I say, OK, thanks for sharing. Was it bigger than Prince's? You know, why are you telling me this? Because how is it pertinent to me? And then he also when he moves from Arizona, when he moves from California to Arizona to this disparate little house he has these shoes and the shoes are in flannel drawstring bags each shoe was in its own bag and of course now remember I've just made home I've been made homeless that's the only reason a bag of Durrell's right because he offered and I'm like you know you have he goes I've had these shoes for 30 years I'm like you've had these shoes for 30 years I go, I don't even have underwear I had six months ago, but you've had these shoes for 30 years. What are those shoes? I mean, I like shoes, okay? I like, I like shoes a lot. I don't want to be a pair of shoes, but I like shoes, okay? But I've never put a pair of my shoes in a drawstring flannel bag. So what are those shoes? Do you have a pair of shoes you had 30 years? No, absolutely not. Are you not. even 30? I'm almost 36. <laughs> Wait, so but yeah, I don't, right? most people don't even keep shoes for a couple years, much less 30. Yes. So then later on, this brings us back to a story I started telling about dads, which was the totem pole. I play for a band called Mr. Red Shoes. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's 2002, okay? I don't know what it is. Sure. The guy's, the guy's name is um, John Lock, Lockhart. And we play at uh, Dad's in Poway. We play February 1st, 2002 and February 2nd, 2002. So the way when you're doing a gig, you get there early and you play it, depending upon if it's a country gig, the country gigs are longer. Some of the, the country gigs may start at eight. Uh, a regular gig is from nine to one. Uh, 145 I think nine yeah nine to 145 that's your last set so you you end 15 minutes before two and they sit and some places they'll stop serving alcohol to, I think the alcohol thing is you have to stop serving it at two okay so um and then so February 1st 2002 I play for Brenda Van Dam and David Westerfield David Westerfield and Brenda Van Dam go home. Brenda has a, a child named Danielle. She says she got home and now it's February 2nd, okay? Because it's, it's two. So she lived very close to there because she left and she got home at two. So she gets home on 02 is February, 02, 2002 at 2 a.m. And there's six people there. She notices in the morning that her daughter is gone. 
David Westerfield, who she was dancing with and drinking with and smoking pot with in the parking lot and doing whatever else, kidnaps her child and rapes her, probably does a snuff film, throws her body 13 miles from David Jeremiah's venue, Shadow Mountain. He was my pastor. And um, she cries about it. Now, I find out later on when I'm in the crazy house, because I'm, I'm doing who, what, when, where, why, and how to regain my memories. And I'm focused on that event. Why was I there? Who was there? Because I remember the feds coming the next day and querying me about her disposition. You know, what was she doing? Da, 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 because I, they came up and they talked to me. Right. It was a small little club. And now I realize that that was a satanic uh, stronghold where they, it was, she was a swinger. The swingers are literally, they're Satanists. So it's basically do what thou wilt, which was, that was uh, Crowley and LaVey's premise for Thelmism, which was occultism, was do what thou wilt. So you can be married, but the marriage doesn't mean like you and I would say marriage means fidelity and and truth and honesty you know that's what it means to you and i and to breach that it's a vow that you take in front of god right it's a vow of of uh you know being with that person and no one else okay but that's not the way they look at it that vow or whatever it was that they took that's just you know hey this person i'm gonna trust with my finances and then i'm gonna I'm going to sleep with whoever I want to. Uh, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a pedophile and rape little children and make lots of money and um, do satanic ceremonies and in deep underground military bases. And no one's ever going to know even who I am because no one knows who I am. And John told me that when I called him and I asked him if he would, uh, if I could use his name for a referral for JAM, which is in, it's an agency in, uh, in Chicago. And when I went there, the lady came down, she was like shaking. And she gives me this little piece of paper with an email on it. And the lady never responded. And I said, because I asked him, can I use your name? And he says to me at that time, no one knows who I am. No one knows who he is. And that's how the covert faction is. No one knows. No one knows who I am. I mean, small populace that actually even you know, watch podcasts and are awake and have an inkling as to, you know, who I am, but seriously, no one, I'm nobody, you know, no one's uh, of notoriety. You don't see me on, um, on your television, on mainstream media, you know, you'd have to actually be researching to find me. And I, I quite often ask people, Hey, how'd you find me? Cause you had to be researching something about MK ultra to find me. Right. And so going back to the Red Shoes, you were performing with a band called Red Shoes. And then was that was was that what was in those shoe bags? Yes. Oh, my gosh. When and David, our- my brother, was murdered, he was murdered. They made him homeless. This is the protocol. They make you home. They kick you out of the workforce. They uh, David was working for Hyperion Water District, which is uh, one of the biggest water districts that uh, funds the L.A. Basin in Los Angeles. He told me he stumbled upon something that was so big. It was like the movie, My Two Jakes, which was the sequel to Chinatown. And it was about mineral rights and gas rights. Only this was about water and what they were doing to the water. They were going to privatize the water. They were also going to blow up the, blow up the, the, um, hold on just a second. They were going to blow up the, the dams, breach the dams and, uh, and blow up, uh, blow up the dams and uh, blow up the bridges and uh, privatize the water. And also he saw they were poisoning, they were putting poisons in the water. And then if you watch some of the X-Files, one of the X-Files is about this worm, wormy guy that gets in the water. And I, I don't know what, I always look at filming locations. Um, I responded to somebody today who told me that the graffiti days was filmed in Petaluma. And I was like, that's weird because when I was there in Modesto, they had Modesto days, which was about the graffiti, American graffiti. And I thought it was filmed in Modesto, but that's what I was told, you know, in the nineties, 
But then I look it up and I'm like, yep, it was, you were right. It was filmed in Petaluma. Um, so he, David gets some, um, some paperwork, a lot of paperwork. And he shows me, he's got this paperwork in at his place in Santa Ana. Um, and then he, he says, he starts carrying a gun. And then he says that they sent him to a psychiatrist. And then he says he talks to God. And then they write that he's schizophrenic, which he's not. Okay. Then later on, my brother Rob tells me that David pulled a gun on him at his house. I don't understand why. Because David let him stay there for a year while my brother Rob was spying on him. That's why he found out who, who he was. And he pulled a gun on him and said, don't ever come to my house again. I didn't understand that at the time. And I said, well, David's, you know, he's ill. He's mentally ill. And he says, no, he's not, Penny. Rob says that to me because he knows what happened to him. He knows he's not. He knows that the CIA, his other brother, John, has made certain that he's discredited because he's writing about Bush. He's writing about the Vatican. He's writing about my family. And the book started with President Tush. And I said, dang, David, you're going to get killed. Because this is very thinly veiled. And then I never read the book. I read the screenplay. And I promised him I would take it to fruition. So then when I contact John and I say, hey, my brother David was murdered. I don't know that he even knows my brother David, much less that he's my brother. It's complex. Yeah. So David gets murdered. He gets made homeless. Uh, he, he moves to Oregon in the middle of the night because he says that he was told if he stayed in California, they were going to murder him and his family. He lives there. He has three children uh, with his wife, Victoria. At some point, he starts writing the book. And then everyone's like, oh, your dad's just a conspiracy theorist. And he's, he's a drunk because he drank. But just because he drank didn't mean that he was crazy. He wasn't. And then he's, he's kicked out of the workforce. He writes, he takes care of his children. Then he gets uh, divorced from his wife. He, become, he comes back to California. They told me he'd be killed if he came back to California. He goes back to California. He lives at Mission Beach for two years with the homeless. I lived 20 minutes away. He was arrested over 50 times. My husband was a retired Carlsbad sergeant and his dad was a deputy sheriff who built the sheriff's museum in old town did they know that where he was yes they did and then he gets murdered on a high satanic holiday which is april 28 2007 they make it look like some drunk just killed another drunk right and i don't find out for two months and then i find out from my sister who calls me from north carolina about a murder that happened 20 minutes from my house in broad daylight the high satanic quality, it was April 28th, which is eight days after Hitler's birthday, but also it's during the satanic grand climax. So I'm also told because they're drugging me by my husband that David's body was liquidated and I don't understand what he's talking about. What do you mean he's liquidated, right? Well, you can't get his body back. They're going to have to cremate it. Now, I also know when I get the remains, it's not David. I don't know whose remains it is, but I know. That's not David. I know it. And then my, when we have this little funeral thing for him in California, my brother Rob is there. He's kind of smirking. And then they ask me to sing. And I, I say, I can't. I'm so heartbroken. I can't sing. I can't. They said, we thought you were going to sing. I said, no, I can't. I didn't sing. I just spoke about him. And then I find out in 2019 from a PI that does a search on John, I find out that John has a shoe company. I pretty much sealed it. So I know what that means. And also it was also a, a method in which he was telling me I played a place called Dad's. He's telling me my dad is your dad. Also, he had Greg Evigan from My Two Dads come down to the JW Marriott when I was down there. And the band was in the back of a movie at the end, the tail end of it. Uh, it was a failed pilot called P.S. I Love You. 
I'm like, Penny Shepherd, I love you. My name at that time was still my maiden name because I hadn't changed it in the first marriage. And, uh, and then after I left John in the 90s, um, I, before I did the country tour uh, for a band called Way Out West, I went and I prayed in the sanctuary and I said, God, please tell me my name. I'm like in my 30s now. And I know when I was like, you know, in sixth grade that my last name was not my last name. Could you please tell me my name? And the voice that I heard said, your last name is Shepherd. Go down and change it at the courthouse and never change it again. So I do what God tells me to do because my God is the God of truth. So I went down the courthouse. I changed the name. And I came back and I told my boyfriend, who eventually, my handler, eventually married me. Uh, I don't think I spelled my name right. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, he said, how, how could you spell your name wrong if that's not your name? I said, oh, no, that's my name. God told me that's my name. But I didn't spell it S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. I spelled it S-H-E-P-A-R-D. And then I didn't understand because when, when, the, when your God, the God of truth, that saved your butt, a million times in your life when you pray to when he tells you to do something and you do it it's for eternity it's not it's not just for this little blip in time which we are a blip in time but it's for eternity so then later on this is in the 90s and then later on in 2016 when i'm in uh illinois and a orchestra leader asked me to represent him and i'm you know thinking well i could book him and make a little bit of money and then I asked God again, hey, what should I call this? And he says, call it Shepherd Entertainment Endeavor. So I was like, I like that. The acronym is C, right? Now, had I not honored what I was told and I never changed my name, I got married again. I did not change my name. And his dad said, is everything you own in the name of Shepherd? I'm like, yeah. So had I not listened and honored that, I would not have started Shepherd Entertainment Endeavors, which the acronym is C. Then when I'm back in Lake Havasu, at Darrell's, I'm still researching John because I don't know who he is. And I find out he brokered a deal for the Crystal Cathedral, which for, is for the Orange Diocese, which was actually owned by Schuler, which Darrell took me to that church. Um, and I find out that the Orange Diocese is the Vatican, and then the Vatican is the Holy See. And I say, holy shit, did I literally sleep with Satan, right? Because I slept with John. And he is in the Holy See, which is the unholy see. So their see, not my see. My see is, hey, do you see? Jose, can you see? <laughs> my see is open your eyes, please. See. Now see. In signs, in the movie Signs with Mel Gibson, um, they go the whole movie, and at the end of it, she says, Tell you know, tell so-and-so to use the bat to swing and you need to see. So that's, that's the message. That's God's message. The actual holy see is unholy. It's not, it's not a holy see. It is unholy. It is run by the mob. It is run by the new world order. It's an unholy thing. The Pope says he's a representative of God on this planet. I think not. You don't need anyone, in my estimation, you need no one to interpret what God is saying to you. It's a unique communication. It pertains specifically to you. So when you're praying or you're meditating and you're asking for answers from source or whomever, you know, the name I use is Jesus. But if you're asking for information from that, that frequency of truth, to say, pray to truth, pray to the God of truth. If you want to pray to the God of lies, that would be the Satans. And it's not just one. It's a species of these reptilian factions. And I believe uh, great, great alien entities, which are, I believe Durell is part gray. Somehow they did a genetic hybridization. Because that's what the experiments were. For MK Ultra? Uh, well, MK Ultra, if you look at it from a broad based spectrum, okay, all covert operations fall under MK Ultra. They all fall under some form of control, of controlling the mind. You control the mind, you control the body, okay? So there are many different forms of 
MK Ultra that are perpetrated on the populace. There are the super soldiers, which are in intensive programs. There are, are the ones that are uh, selected for sex slavery or for breeding or for psychic abilities. Um, so it's a myriad of operations. They're also doing the MK Ultra operations in prisons. They're doing it in universities. They're doing it in hospitals. Uh, so this is global. It's not regional by any means. It's not, oh, they just did it in Langley or they just did it in California or no, this is a global operation. So when someone calls me from Russia and wants to know about the direct energy weapons programs, I'm like, dude, they're global. Or somebody calls me from New York, this, this uh, black gay guy called me from New York and said they were targeting him specifically. And I said, I do believe that. And the police are in on it, but I just want to share with you, it's not just you, okay? It's, it's not just you, you are a select group. So it would be the, you know, a black populace that was gay, uh, a female populace maybe that was gay. And then also what, the Project Montauk was uh, ghost written. The book was ghost written by Pete Nichols, who told me one time on Facebook, I needed to prove that I was 11 from Stranger Things. And I said, I don't need to prove a freaking thing, Pete. I say, I'm just going to write all the thousands of little threads that say that it's me and let, and let everyone else judge. But I know I don't need any verification. I know that it's me. And the Project Montauk was written uh for it was written by Peter Moon for Preston Nichols, who Preston Nichols said it, people were saying, Oh, he's 11. I'm like, No, that boy Nichols, who looked like he was on meth whenever he did a, a podcast, that was not uh, this particular individual, 11, who is a girl. Um, her name is her actual name, birth name was Jane Ives. So I was born in the Hollywood Memorial Hospital, which was. Megan's hospital that she was born in several years later, but I was raised in Ives Estates. I went to Mady Ives Elementary School. I now know that that, that particular region was used by uh, the Germanic paperclip faction for MK Ultra experiments, the entire Ives Estates region, and uh, Jane Doe from Ives, right? Jane Ives. And then she's played by Millie Bobby Brown. My mother's name was Millie. My grandmother's name was Millie. And it's on my birth certificate, you know. Um, they also call her L for 11. So I was born on the 11th of August in 1958. And then also the name of my birth certificate was Penny Lou Fortner. And then Anne was my baptismal name, which I kept, which I kept but I knew my last name was not my last name. And uh, so Penny is actually short for Penelope, and the, the nickname for Penelope is L. They call her L. Um, you know, where the Duffer brothers got this information, because I still believe they actually stole that script. I called, there was a, a gentleman called Charlie Kessler who wrote another thing which uh, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival about a child that was missing and uh, it was an MK Ultra project. And he said that they stole this idea. And then I called his attorney. You know, I work for law firms also. I had my own law uh, documentation specialty for like 30 years. And so I called the attorney, not thinking that it was about, you know, was it a boutique law firm? Because the guy's phone number was right on the litigation. So I called and said, hey, I'd like to talk to uh, Charlie Kessler. He's like, why? And I said, are you having a storm out there? Because I can hear the wind blowing. And I was like, okay, you're outside on your cell phone, which is weird that you put your cell phone on the litigation, right? So he says, yes, we are. And I know I'm mad when I'm calling him and I'm having a storm where I am too, right? So I say, well, I'd like to talk to Charlie Kess for your client. And he says, why? I say, because I was at Montauk and there's like silence on the line. I'm like, hello, hello. <laughs> and then um, I send him, I know it's his cell phone. So I send him a thing and I say, this is my website. Here's my collage. And everyone, all I say is everyone knows that Stranger Things is based on a true story. So I say, and two weeks later, the lawsuits dropped. So I called, I don't know why it was dropped. Coincidental, right? And so I call back 
and I say, hey, this is Penny L.A. Shepard. Sorry the lawsuit got dropped, but I'd still like to talk to Charlie. You know, sorry, Charlie. And um, he says, well, I gave your information to Charlie Petty, but he doesn't want to talk about it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm angry all over again. Now I wonder how the Duffer brothers got so much information because they didn't actually use his thing, right? They didn't use his, his little Tribeca. But still, now I'm back to how do they know so much about me? So I've written a little bit about this in one of the chapters. It's called Green Minds because somebody said that they wanted me to, they wanted to do a very short, like six minute little docu thing explaining, you know, who I was. And uh, he hasn't picked it up yet. He's in Canada. So it's still there for anybody that wants to read how I came to this conclusion that that indeed was me. It freaked me out. And the characters are composites like, there's a there's a character named uh, Dr. Brennan and another one named Dr. Owen, Dr. Owens, and John Brennan from the CIA. His middle name is Owen, so it's possibly a composite of him too. There was another individual that said that John Brennan and Michael Aquino was head of the Church of Satan, psyops, Presidio, where he raped over 200 children and then got off because the NSA said we can't prosecute him under grounds of national security um and he flaunted that to everybody i didn't do it and so she says that john brennan and michael tino were trained by a nazi named carcock in rockford illinois and then the nazi disappeared and she found out he went to minnesota which that's where Durrell's from and where i was held for a year in this facility it's like 33 minutes from Rockford. And the woman that was the omnibudsman for that facility with the Catholic Church, she lives like about two minutes from where this individual said that they were trained. You know, it's the threads. It's all the little threads. But you're not going to get these threads unless you dive into the deep end, start swimming. If you can't swim, dog paddle, you know, so you can get to the other side, you know, Take on a bunch of water, come back up for air, and and then start tying together the threads of your life. Because as I found my life, when I first started writing, I was going to write my life story. And I thought, ah, no one's going to read about my life story. It's unremarkable, <laughs> you know. So remarkable. And then later, Little did you right? know. Right? So, but this is my life. I don't need anyone to verify it and say it's true or it's not true. That's academic to me. But I encourage everyone else. To now start researching the genesis of your families. And I'm not saying go through like, uh, you know, one of these genealogical sites to do it and pay money. I'm saying do it in a unique way in which you take your name and anything that is your name that's related to it is related to you. And take it apart in that aspect. And many people are like, well, I don't know who my, my family was. I was adopted. Say, okay, well, the name that you were adopted under is fundamentally extremely important to you because it now became part of your lineage. So even if that wasn't your blood family, start there. Figure out what, what's going on there. And um, basically names are geographic or occupational. So if you were a baker, you were named bakers. But the bakers were actually the Beckers from Germany. And the Smiths were actually the Schmitz. You know, if you needed a blacksmith in Germany, it would be the blacksmith. I need to go to the blacksmith to get my horse's hooves shaved and polished. That makes sense. There is, like, I don't know. I've never done that research. I've been thinking about it over these last couple of years. I'm like, it's crazy how much we don't know about where we came from. And I feel like that's by design. They don't encourage us to look up that, you know, we're just told to focus on our, our regular family, what we see every day, but there's really not encouragement to go look that up. Now for these MKUltra programs, is there, do names and genealogy have to do with who's selected for these projects? Or is there other ways that they select uh, the children that go into this program? Yes, it's yeah. names, it's genealogy, it's bloodlines, um, it's blood types. Um, you know, when you're, when you're born years ago, when you were born, they stamped your little feeties on a piece of paper, Yeah. right? Like 
they're your feet were your fingerprints. Okay, now I can't get that anymore. But uh, and they're also taking DNA samples from everyone. I believe that at some point they started chipping us. I know I was chipped when I was a child. I was taken away. My my sister said that I disappeared for like two months. They said I had pneumonia and I was taken to the hospital and treated for pneumonia. I don't think that was what actually happened. <laughs> um, and to say they put me through some programming. And then my mom said when I came back, I was singing this old man at eight months of age. Whoa. I was like, yeah. Did I know the words and everything, Ma? Or was I just humming it? <laughs> wow. But maybe I was humming because they were electroshocking me and I came back going, mm. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I don't know. I can't tell you what happened to me. I can't tell you. I can't tell you throughout my life. I became, uh, I was smart and then stupid and then smart and then stupid. I said there was a grocery store in California called Smart and Final. So finally, I'm smart again. Schmott, get schmott. Do you have a shoe phone? Just ask it. Did you ever see Get Smart? Yeah, a while ago I've seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a friend, the same one that went by Betsy Ross. I call her every once in a while because one time she called me. She said, "I'm in the I'm in the bathroom right now. I need to talk now." And I said, I so I text her back. Are you calling from the shoe phone in the bathroom? Because I just want to know. You know, do you have your shoe phone on you? She said, I did have a shoe phone. <laughs> In the days when, when they sold these weirdo phones, like Sports Illustrated shoe phone, she said, I had a phone that was shaped like a shoe. Yes, I did. But in, in Get Smart, he actually takes his shoe off and, you know, talks to his shoe. They call it a shoe phone. I got to answer my shoe phone. Your sh is your shoe ringing? That's what he says in there. So it's just a little joke. <laughs> And so genealogy, bloodlines are what they, there is a strategy to how they choose who enters the program. What is their end goal for these programs? Why do they exist to begin with? And what, what are they looking to do with them? Enslavement. Enslavement. Enslavement control. So if we take it to another level, right? Um, and we take it to... Um, the, who the Satans are, which are a species of Draco reptilians. We take it to that level um, and we say that they're from another realm, which would be a planet or a plan of ETs, plane of ETs, right? Um, and uh, as their, their primary mission is that of acquisition. They acquire, they go to a planet, they acquire everything on that planet. They acquire the air, the, the resources. Uh, they institute financial systems, which are uh, enslavement systems and religion for uh, mind control purposes. And then government, which is govern the mental of the people. And uh, their end goal is to control all the resources on the planet. Um, like in Independence Day, where uh, he says that the president is controlled by this entity that they've captured. He says, what do they want? And he says, they're like locusts. They come to every planet and they acquire all the resources. And because uh, he asked them, hey, can we have peace? And the entity says, no peace. He says, well, what do you want? He says, your death. They're psychopaths. Wow. And speaking of that movie, you've mentioned a couple of times during this show, and I know you've mentioned it in, in other interviews that they erase you and going back to men in black, that little pen that they use. I don't know if that's the exact thing that they use to erase somebody, but that actually exists. They can actually, yes, it does. yeah, it's, um, it's called a neuralizer in men in black. They call it the, the flashy thingy, right? But it's a neuralizer. And you can be effectively erased by light. Uh, when I was playing through the disco era, they would have a disco ball and the disco ball could actually elicit uh, an epileptic fit because it, it's a light. So light refractions can erase you. Light though also is, has healing properties. So it can actually, the, actually light can heal you. You can use light to whiten your teeth. Okay, so light has light in and of itself, not a bad thing, but they will use something that God made for good 
and use it for their nefarious purposes. So you can be erased through, um, through many methodologies. You can erase through traumatic shock. Somebody in your family dies, it erases you a little bit. Of it. You, you know, you get raped. You can't remember the person's face until you like go back and relive it. You get drugged. Uh, you know, scopamine makes you into a zombie. You just go, and you be, you be sleeping, and they come up to you and just blow well, that zombie drug in you, and you're up dancing like uh, Weekend and Bernie's. You know, and uh, you're not going to remember anything. Although Weekend at Bernie's, he was actually dead, but you know, you get the basic uh, premise. So yeah. yes, they can utilize drugs. They can utilize light. They can utilize electroshock which will, uh, that's what, that's what Dong Yoon Cameron was doing. He was utilizing all of these methodologies to erase that person. So there was one woman that came out of one of his studies and she still doesn't, she didn't remember her husband or her children. Uh, she had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. And effectively that happened to me when I was in, when I went to Illinois, I had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. I had to relearn my technology. My brother Rob kept saying, hey, remember who you are? And I'm like, how? And I felt like I had just come out from POW camp, which I had. My entire life has been one, you know, one Auschwitz after another, essentially. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's just amazing how deep this goes and how widespread this web is. I think that's why the public has a hard time grasping it, because like you've done your research and you know from experience the web and who's connected to who what locations matter to what the names the symbology that all matters and that's something we were talking before we jumped on here people don't know how to do research how to start and they're not doing research so when they just hear of the idea or the ideology of it they're thinking that sounds crazy that's a conspiracy theory there's no way that's real but if you dig into this research that you are presenting today all these connections those exist and you can find that information and put those pieces together. You have to also be prepared for it. I remember when I first started researching, somebody sent me something on reptilians and I was like, what is this poppycock? And then a year later, I was like, oh, shiite. And I went back and I reviewed it and I'm like, huh, that makes sense because we're basically lied to about everything. So you need to re-educate yourself what the government wants to do is they want to send you to re-education centers to re-educate you again on all the lies that they've told you. They don't like the fact that people are waking up and they're finding out the truth and they're becoming independent. And I tell people, rely upon yourself for your own research. You can do it. You know, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to research some of these things. Just Google MK Ultra. If you can't type, speak it in your phone and then just hey what is it and then when you get into one subject on the wiki i'm not saying trust everything that's on the wiki but i am saying do some research and you will find out what's real and what's not real but most legit mostly the stuff that's out there is legit so uh and it's compiled from this vast database of books that we used to have which are now digitized and on the web for your disposal so if you google um say lookout mountain Click on every single thing that's in that wiki. Every single thing. Get yourself a bunch of, get yourself a bunch of composition notebooks. Take the last page and cut it out, and tape it on the front, and then write the the month and the year, and then start writing because you're never going to be able to research something to its fruition. So you have uh, something on uh, Joseph Mengele, the Joseph Mengele one, Joseph Mengele two, Joseph Mengele three. Uh, Susie and I were looking for a hit list that uh, James Cosmo put out, and uh, it took us like five minutes. We went through a hundred books, five minutes. Oh, there it is. 40, it, I, I wrote down all the names of the hit list, and there were 40 names, and surprising who was on that list. I'm not sure where he is right now, but, uh, you know, he's out there, and he's working for the Vatican. He's not, there are good super soldiers and bad super soldiers. Cosbo, bad. Now, when Just you started that. having your memories later on in life, can you explain what that was like? Freaky. Okay, so I became made homeless. And the first one was, why does John look like Joseph Mengele? Why does my brother David, who was murdered, look like Rolf, their son? And why do I look Irene Mengele? And I asked the question and it was crickets. And then... Um, I just started asking more questions 
And each question became a new revelation. And I remember I was going from Starbucks to Starbucks and uh, the baristas at some of the Starbucks were like, are you okay, ma'am? And my standard answer was, I uh, just found out something copiously evil about my family. Because a couple of times they were like, are you going to pass out? It was shocking. Literally, you will be shocked. You will cry. You will be pissed. But you will be able to circumvent it. You will be able to smile again. You know, while you're being attacked, it's not, it's not comforting. But find some joy in your life. Find a way to make happiness and you know in my instance when i'm re when i'm recanting the things that i've found out i do try to make light of some of it because it's such a horrific thing that we have to go through but i want people to know you will survive i sang that song forever the gloria Gaynor song I sang that song forever i remember i was singing it when my brother rob was at this one place and an unusual thing happened to me I was singing it and I had my headset on and I was at the bar and I was watching this guy who was, uh, who was, he was drunk and he was bothering my friend. So I wanted to tell the bartender, this guy needs to be 86. So while I'm singing it, I'm writing a note at the same time, upside down to the bartender. And then I give it to him. And then later on, when I got back on stage, I was like, how did I do that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it's little things in your life that you will you will remember a memory and then ask yourself who, what, when, where, why, and how. How did I do that, right? That will start you for, and people are like, how do I research my own life? That's how you do it. When you start researching Lookout Mountain, thought pops in your head about something that happened in your life, write it down, and then ask, put, write it down, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then start researching that incident that you just remembered, because that's a key to your life that was erased. When I was working for John, I had this, um, I had this belt. It was a gold belt. It had three, three little layers on the gold belt, and it had keys and locks on it. So Madonna wrote a song, uh, Open Your Heart. You hold the locks and I have the keys, right? So... I didn't have the keys or the locks. They were held by somebody else. Now I have the keys and the locks. And that's what you need to do. You need to take control over the information source. You need to stop listening to the, the controlled narrative. You need to question everything. And like John D'Souza said before he blocked me, trust no one, Penny. Now I pretty much don't. Um, and you approach it with that aspect, research everything, vet everyone. And sometimes you can't vet them in, an, in a day. Sometimes you sit back and you just wait until they show themselves as to who they are. You may not know right away. Great advice. That's, that is a question people have, you know, where do I start? Especially cause there is, there's so much, like what part do you start at? You know, but I always think like you said, relating it to yourself and like learning yourself first and then expanding on that is such a great place to start. And that's a good tip too, for people, you know, like me who haven't done a lot of research in their life about their own lineage, you know, about the, about looking at their past and trying to correlate those little connections in their own life and then seeing how that connects to the bigger picture and then researching everything else that we're talking about in here. I absolutely love that. And I think, you know, for people listening, what are some things that in your opinion, the world's crazy right now. Everybody's stressed out. Everybody's living in fear. It's propagated and proliferated in our face 24, seven, three, six, five, you know, and, and it's affecting even the strongest people. How do we, as a society, in your opinion, can we change and re-navigate what's going on in a more positive direction in the world with the new world order agenda? Is that something that we have the capabilities to do? Or do you think that we're so far down this rabbit hole that they're, they've been working on for decades that there's not a way to switch that around? Well, the new world order isn't going away. It's been here for millennia. So just the awareness and the cognizance. And then as you find out things about your life and the things that was done that were improper about your life, I encourage everyone to write, write a blog. Blogspot is free. Uh, Medium.com is free. Wix is free. 
Um, WordPress is free. These are all free modalities. So you start a blog on Blogspot and then I post on all those mediums and also on my website, but my website isn't as updated as my Blogspot because I can write on my phone on my Blogspot. And then in order to do it on my website, I, it's a very laborious process in which I have to copy the pictures over and then upload them and go through an editor. So, um, and if something does happen to me, because I know there's a hit on me, I'm not going to be paying for my blog if I'm not here. But those free sites, they're, they're going to be up. So I encourage everybody, hey, you know, you don't have means, use the free sites. I don't have means either, but, you know, find a way. That's, that's a free way. And then people will start calling you from Germany and from Russia and saying, hey, what's this MK Ultra thing? Or, oh, gosh, my story's like yours. And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is to just start writing, just start writing. If you can write on Facebook, you can write a blog. And if you don't know how to set it up, Google it, use Google. Okay. Don't stop using Google, but you know, you can do, a, you can see a video on setting up a Wix or setting up blog spot. You'd be up in 10 minutes. And then if anything that you post on Facebook, you can post there because not everyone's on Facebook, believe it or not. Yeah. A lot of people got kicked off, you know, of all these more popular social media platforms these last couple of years. So people have had to find alternative ways to have their voice heard and to connect with like-minded people because those platforms don't really like us talking about this stuff. <laughs> no, I'm also on Telegram. I have a, a I have my four groups. I have two MK Ultra groups on Facebook. One is MK Ultra See Me Now Agent X11. That's me, Agent X11. And then the other one is MK Ultra Stranger Things, Agent X11. And then those are my two on Facebook. They're research groups. So, you know, anybody that wants to research and, you know, be nice when you're in there. Don't, you know, be mean to the other people because everyone's trying to research. And then uh, I have a group on Telegram and a group on um, it's not, it's Signal. That's the other one. And I'm on uh, Twitter. My Twitter, M I I G, or Shepherd Out, and Agent X Eleven. There, there goes Bobo behind you. <laughs> and uh, so you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn, Penny L A Shepherd. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me, uh, they can they can text my phone. I won't answer unless you're in my contact. So you can text my phone. My phone is six one nine seven seven nine nine seven seven one and just text my phone say who you are i'll put you in my contacts i'll text you back and if i have time we'll talk right then or you know say hey text me when you can talk um if you have anything that you want to send me you can send it to me on my phone say hey look at this uh, right now i'm engaged in researching um megan walsh's father john walsh which is pretty epic his connections uh, i'm currently researching the mob in um, in Florida and uh, in the Hollywood PD department in which uh, the whole Otis Tool um, PSYOP was created by the Hollywood PD where they basically told Otis, hey, this is what happened. I just got another link from one of my researchers. So if you want, if you're really good at researching too, uh, I'm looking for researchers for Megan's team. Um, I'm basically the, the lead researcher. I told her when we first started talking, we need a research team. So anybody that wants to help me is a prolific researcher, feel very confident on their researching uh, things. And then also my email, but I would suggest you contact me on my phone because I, I have like, I don't know, 70,000 emails. So yeah, I know I need to clean it out, but I've been busy. <laughs> Um, so if you, if you want to contact me, just text my phone, but my email is my name, Shepard, S-H-E-P-A-R-D, the word entertainment dot, uh, at gmail.com. And then my blog is Shepard entertainment dot blogspot dot com. And my email is Shepard entertainment at gmail.com. And my web is Shepard and then a hyphen, which is a little dash entertainment dot com. So that, that web isn't as updated as uh, my blog. I have 35 chapters right now. When I first started writing, when I was homeless, I basically thought I was going to uh, expose the Antichrist, which would be my brother. And then I was like, no, nah, that's not right. He's not Satan. And then later on, I was like, ooh, he's a Satan. No, he's not the Satan. 
because there's a lot of Satans. Johnny Depp and Marilyn Manson sing say 10. 10 heads of the beast. Yeah. And, you know, and stop idolizing, stop idolizing Hollywood idols. Oh my gosh. I know I'll have to bring you on and just do a whole episode on the entertainment industry. You know, there's so much in that, that people are unaware of, and they're still paying money to it and paying attention to it. And they shouldn't be, you know, and it's, I think that having you back on again, if you would want to come back on again, that would be a fun topic. Sure. I see you being been a pleasure. on periodically, you know, so much, like, I feel like we just scraped the iceberg today, which I love because you gave just enough information. People can go process that research what you've said, connect with you, and then we can bring you back on soon and, and kind of dive into maybe a single topic or a couple topics for the hour, two hours. Um, and then also take suggestions for people. If you guys have suggestions on stuff you'd want Penny to talk about, you can always reach out to her and she'll, you know, if she has time, she can reach back out to you and, and help you with that. But send us your suggestions too. If you want to see her come on and talk about a specific topic, uh, we can bring Penny back on and uh, she's offered to do that. So Penny, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to list all of your thank stuff you. below. If there's anything you forgot, any uh, social, what's your telegram group called, by the way? Um, let me look. <laughs> I, know a lot I of think people. it's MK Ultra Agent X11. So let me just look. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll link it to you at the bottom. But okay, I know a lot so, of people use Telegram right now and they'd probably be really excited. Telegram is MK Ultra Agent X11 and it's a picture of the CIA and then I'm at the bottom of that. I, of course, cut John's picture out of it, but, you know, <laughs> in the actual one I have, he's the head of MK Ultra. Wow. And uh, then my signal is not now is it's a picture of agent x11 and it's mk ultra see me now agent x11 i'm also on me we getter minds.com um linkedin discord wimkin bitshoot not actually posting a lot on bitshoot but i encourage everybody use whatever social media platform is available don't say oh well the cia is on that really because they're on everything okay they're on your phone they're on your ipad they're in your computer they're in your head you know a lot of us have implants in our heads some people have voice to skull in their heads and they're taking the people that have voice to skull in their head which is very well known that that is an actuality and they're saying they're schizophrenic wow yeah it's so dark it is. It's so sad too. And you it know, it's, I know I was telling you this earlier, but it's like, you look at people who are labeled as crazy much differently after you learn this information. And it's like, are they really crazy or do they just know too much that the controllers don't want them to, to get out and they don't want people to believe them. So they just label them yeah. as crazy, you know? Another thing is, you know what? Be kind to people that are homeless. If you've got money on you, give him some, give him some money, you know, in liar, liar, the guy says, uh, I'm not going to give you the money. Cause I just know you're just going to go and drink it somewhere. Give them the money. If they choose to drink, let them drink. If they choose to eat, let them eat. If you have no idea that could be you on the street. That could be your brother on the street that you didn't even know that you had. He is your brother. He ain't heavy. He's your brother. And so take the time out of your day to be kind to one another be kind to one another this world is so full of just egregiously evil people i get attacked yeah. you know a bunch of times during the day but i still get back up again you get knocked down but you get back up again that's a song yep that is a song for people who have been around a little bit they'll know it <laughs> right so i'm just saying be kind to one another help those people that are homeless because you don't know what why that person is homeless i was homeless i lived in the back of my truck I dressed well. I always put my makeup on. I went to Starbucks. I worked all day long. You know, not having a, a regular day gig is still doesn't mean that you're not an industrious person. Perhaps that individual actually got kicked out of the workforce because of what he knew. There's PhDs that are homeless and not because they're drug addicts. Not everyone on the street is there because they're drug, drug addicts. So I'm just saying, 
you know, I'm not saying bring a homeless person home. I'm just saying help them out when you can be kind to one another. It's a very cold and different world. Maybe have a, co- a talk with somebody and find out who they actually are. You know, and, and that's part of what the COVID thing, they don't want you uh, talking to anybody. You have to keep your distance from each other. Don't hold somebody's hand. Don't hug them. You know, um, these are these are not good things. They're things that are meant to divide us and separate us. So I'm just going to say be kind to one another. And thank you so much, Penny, for being an example of that. You know, even you can tell your essence even on Twitter and your social media. You're so kind to people. And despite everything that you've been through, you still show up with a smile. You're still just so delightful and enchanting. And I'm so grateful <laughs> to you. I'm sorry. My sister's talking to me at the same time you're talking to me. What? Oh, no. <laughs> marigolds were called mosquitoes. Oh, marigolds. My sister said marigolds repel mosquitoes. Oh, good to know. And they make marigold shampoo. Ooh, natural remedy to mosquitoes instead of all yes, the you toxic can you spray. can never have enough good uh, information. A hundred percent. Thank you for, <laughs> for providing that. Yes. Thank you. Do you want to say goodbye? Just come over and say goodbye. We're saying goodbye now. So she's fixing to go outside and and wrangle and wrangle the horses. Get them. Gotta go do the horsey thing. Can they see you? Okay, yes, so that's to say goodbye. Say so goodbye. Good We're signing off. And Penny, okay. thank you so much. It's such an honor thank to you. have you on, and I've learned so much from you. And vice versa, ditto. It's been an honor to uh, be on your show, and it's an honor just to to know you because what you're doing is awesome. So I just want to thank you for the people that you're having on the show, and you're helping them to disclose uh, some egregious things, which are you know getting them killed basically. I know. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you too, Penny. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. I'm sure I'll talk to you. Okay. On Twitter, so. <laughs> Bye Penny. How do I, Thank how do I get so out of here? Much. All right. You guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Penny had to run. So I wanted to finish up and didn't want to keep her on waiting for that, but Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Penny's just absolutely incredible, as you guys can tell. And I really encourage you guys to go connect with her. I also encourage you guys, if you guys got value out of this episode, which I don't know how you couldn't have, she just gave you so many different things to go research. And we just went down so many different rabbit holes and barely even scratched the surface. So I encourage you guys to all go research what she said, maybe even listen again, take some notes and and go, go check it out for yourself and start connecting some of these thoughts. Share this episode with everybody that you know raise Penny's voice up, subscribe, give us a review if you can, if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, write us some comments, interact with us on YouTube and all the other platforms that we're on, connect with us on our Telegram. I have all that information below. I have all Penny's information below. So please go connect with her on all those different platforms that she mentioned. And then please also go follow our sister podcast, the Save Our Children podcast. They're one of our sponsors and we work together as a team to give this information to you. So please go support them also. You guys, thank you so much. I can't wait to see you guys again next week. And if you guys need anything, you know where to find me. I'll see you guys next week.